I don't know if this is really easy, but Andrew, I've, I've got one for you looking at the profile of Australian dairy, maybe even Will as well, or if you want to add on this, Greg, feel free. Um, is the, the export market for Australian dairy got hit quite a lot with the dairy crisis and with the drop in milk production. Do you think that export market and what we send out as a nation is going to change a lot now? You've seen there's people flying fresh milk uh, as the example with Norco and also with um, Kai Valley in my area and other companies as well. There's there's more ice cream going out of the country, but um, is it are we going to stay this cheese and butter exporter, or is there going to be room for change there? Yeah, I think it'll it'll change. Oh, we'll I'll get you to speak in a microphone. Sorry, as it, it'll, can. Ch it'll change a bit. Maybe maybe not as fast as everyone um, would like it to. There's a, there's a lot of investment in kind of value value add products and innovative products. Um, for export markets, and we see that forming kind of a bigger chunk of um, Australia's exports. Um, the domestic market is also expanding here, um, so you know exports don't form, I don't think, quite as much um, of the volume of, this, of Australian milk production as they used to. So that that that's changing a little bit, but um, you know I think the investments in cheese and skim milk powder butter manufacturing are big and long term, and that that'll still form a significant. Um, part of our our export sort of um, mix and still be significant determinants of of prices here at home and, and production. Yeah. Has anyone else got a question they'd like to throw out yet? Well, while you're ruminating, I might get uh, of this. Andrew and Will, you might like this one as well. Um, looking at the forecast, the ABS forecasts, and and what you were speaking about, long term look, Will, how precarious do you think? the dairy industry is um, in the Murray-Darling when you're talking about the, the price of water being a determinant factor in what people are paying and so forth. You were looking at those models before saying that's under a perfect scenario. But I suppose we've had financial stress hit the region with Fonterra, murray Goulburn dairy crisis. What happens if there's environmental stress? What happens if there's a, a drought in that region and water then leaves dairy for almonds or cotton or something? Like, does the industry look likely to, to suck that back at any stage? I don't think volatility oh, in the market... Pull the mic in if you can. <laughs> oh, closest. Yeah. All right. They're brilliant. So, um, market volatility and extremes are not new to Australian dairy. And so, yeah, I think you'll see some of those scenarios potentially occur. And then we've shown ourselves to be pretty resilient in the long term to them. Um, do I know or do we have a firm prediction that any of those is going to event eventuate? No, we don't. Um, when we look at those numbers that are presented, we know that... Uh, farmers have not only got the sort of productive flexibility and capacity, but they've got the balance sheet flexibility as well to adjust to those market shocks. Um, if you're talking about a longer sustained environmental change, I think that's a bigger, you know, it's a whole different panel session, I think, yeah. because it's not going to be a dairy, an issue about dairy, it's going to be an issue about ag. Mm. But clearly it's something that we've got to, I suppose, um, turn our minds to in the longer term. Mm. Uh, has anyone got a question yet? Oh, there we go. Go for it up there. Uh, my question, I think, is to Greg. Um, my name's Ken Baxter. I'm a former chairman of the Australian Dairy Corporation and also the Dairy Research and Development Corporation um, several years ago. Greg, my only comment is, in the last few weeks, I'm surprised there hasn't been the equivalent of Pat Rowley sitting in Melbourne trying to resolve the Murray Goldman issue. <laughs> but my, my comment actually arises from Greg's presentation, which shows that a cooperative in this country can be made to work very effectively, very efficiently over a very long period of time and keep its um, providers and its customers happy. My question is, and it's a bit difficult knowing that um, Saputo is circling Murray Goulburn at the moment and the ACE Triple C's there, but has the time been reached after what, now three managing directors uh, over a period of 10 years, that the cooperative model is not really the suitable model for Murray Goulburn, and that there needs to be some very significant changes in the governance of that body, including the board of directors, um, which at times have really pushed the limits of governance issues. Um, and if nothing is done, and because of its um, size and eminence in the industry, are we going to face another set of rotations of Saputo perhaps taking over um, or somebody else taking over Murray Goulburn and then having this conversation again in another five years' time? Or does it really need some very strong intervention? 
Glad you get the easy questions, Greg. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I won't comment about Murray Goldman. I'll comment in principle. Um, I think I don't think the structure actually stops. I don't think any particular structure stops a business model from working. It's the people within the business model that make it work. So if Norco needed to access um, $100 million and we, in the business case, um, was sufficient that it, we could make it work, then I don't believe I'd have too much trouble convincing a bank or an investor to actually put some money in. Um, the question is around governance, and, the dairy, and I've been involved in the dairy industry for over 20 years, and I've been to many, many governance training courses with Murray Golden people and other industry people. Um, I don't think governance training has helped anyone too much, to be honest. I think, I think it's in building you. I think it's the values that you actually bring to the business. And, um, and I really do feel for the Murray Golden directors because they were taken on a journey, um, willingly probably, uh, and that's all right, but it's always hard to say no. It's always hard to put it up your hand and say, no, I've had enough. Um, and, I, and I think that gets... And I think um, as, an, as a cooperative, you've got to find good people to actually run that business, and if they don't fit, then you've got to be prepared to weed them out. As hard as that is, it's, I'm sure anyone that's in business or, or manages people, the hardest thing of your job is to say to someone, you're not, you, you're not suited to this business. And that's, that's just tough. Um, but it doesn't mean to say you can't let it go because the reality is, um, in my case, 210 farms, 800 employees are let down and I just won't let that happen. Uh, and that's what we've got to entrain our next generation of people to be hard-nosed in business. It's, the cooperative model doesn't fail. People fail the cooperative model. There's another question just here as well. Just following on that from that though, Greg, does, you've seen what can go wrong then with a cooperative. You're a passionate cooperative man. Do you worry what can go wrong with your own business? Oh, every day. <laughs> it's like, you have no idea. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, the challenge is um, farmers and helping farmers understand uh, in today's world, um, it's good to be transparent um, and we can talk about most things, but you have to trust the people you put in to actually run that business and let them do their job. Yeah, it's, it's as simple as that. Next yeah, Andrew Aldridge, uh, Dairy Farmer Tassie. Um, Where is he? Just, uh, just on that um, Murray Goulburn, uh, the, the, the scenario we're facing at the moment, in, in the near future it's looking like there's, there's not going to be an Australian, a, a large, and ex, excuse, but uh, you, you're only in northern New South Wales and Queensland, so a large Australian-owned manufacturer um, now in the market. I mean, what's the what's the risk as a farmer? I, I, I see that there is there is downside and p possibly upside from from the um, from the sale of Murray Goulburn. But what's is there any idea on the risk that that could have to to the, the Australian dairy industry? It's um, oh, can I have a go there? Um, I think. My observation in the industry, um, so when I started the industry in 1996, I've become a director in 1996, um, and the industry was pretty much made up of cooperatives, and I, don't, I can't remember the exact number, but it would have been close to 90% of the industry um, cooperative-minded people. And they were very collegiate, they worked together, well, very fiercely independent, uh, worked very well t um, together. There was some you know, fabulous people, you know, the Pat Rollies of the world, the Ray Hills of the Q QUF or Parmalat, the and the, you know, the, um, Ralph Le um, Layson and a few others in Victoria and the Bonlax guys, they all got on really well and they all were working for a better Australia. I would suggest in, in the new environment that doesn't exist. They're working for their own individual shareholders in their own individual companies. Um, and that's not to say that's a bad thing, but that doesn't necessarily build a better Australia. That's my observation. Anything to add there from anybody else? Well, I think if we're talking about... So I think I agree with a lot of what Greg's saying. I'd be more concerned about the, how they operate rather than where their shareholders sit. So you know, we view our role as an industry participant is to, to build it, to feed into the prosperity of agriculture, not feed from it. And if you've got a processor that's looking to see their role is to feed into the prosperity of dairy rather than feed from it, then I think it's a really powerful place to be, sort of the new lexicon of the shared economy, making sure that we're all creating extra value and sharing appropriately in the value we create according to how much effort and risk we're taking in that supply chain. So I don't think any of that is dictated by where your shareholders sit. I think it's more about management and the ethos of the company. There are some very, very good overseas companies with fantastic morals and they are invested in their communities and their and their, um, uh, the economies they operate in, um, it's not necessarily something dictated by uh, where your shareholders sit. 
I suppose we'll have to wait and see if Saputo is one of those. Um, Will, to you, just you're talking about how well your customers coped with um, the, the downturn in the dairy industry and, and you gave us some of the a light on some of the numbers there. I'm interested in your thought, though, from your one bank. Do you think that's an industry-wide um, picture or do you think you're more conservative, say, in your lending to, say, other, other lenders in the marketplace for dairy? No, I think that would be a pretty similar story on the way through and I think each bank will differ a little bit. We, we I think, will lend a little bit more against perishable securities. So I take a, water, a mortgage over stuff that walks or flows down a creek a bit more than some others. But by and large, I think we're, we're lending to, as a total farming operation, pretty similar sort of levels. Um, so no, I think that's, that's been, a pretty good, been a pretty good story for the sector as a whole. And um, you're not seeing any of those large losses come through in the public figures that I can see from our competitors. So it's pretty good. And you know, while I say we, the customers cope really well, I don't want to downplay at all the stress and the disruption that it caused to those farmers at the time because it was significant and um, we don't want to downplay the impacts of those that perhaps are non-financial. I've oh, got a question there. Um, yeah, Charlie McLean, Dairy Australia. Just for you, Greg, um, you talk a bit about the trust, particularly with a focus on the consumer and the importance of that for Norco. We've been talking a lot as the industry about the trust between the processor and the farmer, um, particularly with, with you know, the companies you know, outside that cooperative structure. Um, some of your views about how we rebuild that, you've talked about the, the changes that we've seen in the last 20 or so years through the industry, and that being a, a pretty significant one for the last period. Um, how do we rebuild that side of the equation, that trust between processor and farmer? Yeah, um, interestingly enough, um, a roundabout way to answer this question, Charlie. So I've been doing a bit of work for um, Barnaby Joyce's office asked me 18 months ago to do the work for um, create a peak body for the organic industry. And naively, I decided to take on that job. Um, which was a six-week task, but I'm still doing it, and I've got another six months to go. But um, and one of the learnings I've actually uh, learnt from the organic sector, so the organic sector is incredibly diverse, incredibly opinionated, and really hard to actually uh, bring together, but they all fundamentally believe in the philosophy of organics. And if so, if, there's, if the dairy sector is going to do what the organic sector have just done and create their own peak body and said, yes, we need to be able to work together, then the Australian dairy sector needs to actually figure out how they actually get together without actually talking about milk price, but say we're about building a strategic plan that actually builds an Australian uh, dairy sector going forward. And, and that's, uh, I'm a great supporter of peak bodies and uh, whether it's Dairy Australia, where it's ADF, um, because they, um, people underestimate the work they do behind the scenes, and I'm not pitching to, <laughs> to Ian or, or to Charlie, but people underestimate what those uh, organisations bring to the table, whether it's in government negotiations or defending themselves in um, you know, uh, incidences that, that happen across um, Australia or even globally. And So I think uh, if there's one thing that the Australian dairy sector could do was... Um, create a forum where, the, um, where senior people within organisations could get, learn to get to know each other and actually um, participate and get that general principle view that we're here to actually work um, collegiately together as an industry. Do you think they could, groups like Dairy Australia, since you've got them captive in the room, Greg, do you think they could learn from a business like yours in terms of trying to keep trust with, with your suppliers in terms of how they interact with, with all the farmers and the people involved in the industry? Uh, look, I think Dairy Australia do a pretty good job. Um, you know, it's, I, th I think most peak bodies do. I think people listen to the small majority. You know, it's, there are lots of um, good organisations doing good work. What you don't know is when they don't exist, what you've got left, and, and when you get a crisis, what actually transpires. Um, we have great... You know, the dairy sector has great resources. Our challenge is now is how do we take those resources and do something with them for the benefit of the whole dairy sector? Mm. And I must commend you all as an audience because when Greg mentioned trust and Barnaby Joyce's office, no one laughed. So well done. <laughs> no. Well done to you all. Uh, we've got another question up the back. Thanks. I, I think I, I should preface that. my remarks or question two with um, the fact I think that Australian dairy farmers are wonderful people. Um, they work very, very hard. They're um, excellent on the farm. They do everything that I can see um, appropriately and they still don't win in a sense. I've, I've, I'm from Canada and I've interviewed um, probably 50 dairy farmers in New Zealand and probably 70 in Australia 
in Queensland, um, Victoria, and Tasmania as well. And I've interviewed Pat Rowley as well. I spent two hours with him one day. And I would say he's not sanguine about the prospects for the Australian dairy industry. And I'm just wondering with Andrew and Will, if you could be completely wrong in your forecast. And I'm sure that you would probably have sat up there in 2012 or 2013 and said the, the um, future for dairy looks robust. You know, prices are going to keep going up. And of course, then there was a huge crash that happened shortly thereafter. So I'm a little bit suspicious of that. Also, Australia is probably on track to produce the least amount of milk that it has for 35 years this year coming up. Um, you've had a lot of farmers leave the industry. Um, you don't mention the United States as well in terms of milk surplus that it's generating, which is about 2% per year, way above. I, in Canada, we suffer the slings and arrows of American um, demands to access the Canadian market. We have a supply managed system, so it's completely shut off from the rest of the world. Well, more or less shut off, but we actually suffer through a lot of that as well, still, even so. So I'm just wondering, you know, is the scenario that you portrayed is pretty decent for most Australian dairy farmers? That's not the story I heard in particular in Queensland, where farmers who'd been dairy farmers for five years said that they would not allow their children to take over the farm because there was nothing in it for the kids. Um, I don't think I met one um, <coughs> Queensland dairy farm, and maybe it was this the group that I interviewed, who was really happily um, focused on the future in Queensland. I had one farmer who milked 1,200 jerseys who told me that he thought Australians would be starving in 20 years. I don't believe that, but that was his take on it anyway. But all these kinds of things sort of enter into a narrative. Australia is becoming a marginal producer in the world market. You export less now than you did in 2001, the year of deregulation. You know, quite a bit less, more than 50% less than you did back then. So how is it then that you can say, you know, you're going to continue with your current model? Um, the situation looks pretty good, mm. more or less, maybe not really robust, but okay. Um, farmers are doing well enough. You know, only 2% left the industry last year in rural bank instead of the normal four. You'd hardly even know that there's a crisis. And I think that, in a sense, <laughs> well, you'll be pining for the days of Murray Goldburn once Saputo takes over as well. So as a Canadian, I can speak to that, <laughs> a little bit about that company anyway. So um, I'm just wondering, you know, how confident are you in your projections for the future based on what's happened in you know the last three or four or five years um oh we're we're, we're always pretty confident in our forecasts <laughs> <laughs> what did you say in 2012 <laughs> someone tweet that now no <laughs> yeah i mean you're right it's the nat it's the nature of forecasting to be wrong almost always but um uh you know we, we sort of see it as a the, the main scenario, what we what we forecast, there's always always risks, um, as I've hopefully outlined here. The f the fundamentals in the dairy industry, um, as as you said, you're right. It's been a long long period of structural adjustment since um, deregulation. I don't know if pre deregs kind of the right um, model of the Australian dairy industry to be to be comparing today to, because so much has changed. Um, so there, there's a lot going on. The exits from the industry are, you know, s it, they've slowed markedly since the kind of initial wave. So that's almost less of an issue than it, than it used to be. And we're, we're, we kind of see the, the situation going forward as being reasonably supportive of an expansion now. So, you know, we think we can start to kind of lift milk production a little bit. Um, we, I don't think it'll be continually fall. It's, it's been basically kind of fluctuating around nine, nine billion litres for a, a decade. So it's, you know, it, if you look very long term, the line down can be a bit scary. But if you focus in on the on the recent past, it's, you know, much, kind of a, a more steady, steady kind of industry story, I think. And um, Will, can I just get you to jump in there in a, in a slight way? Because I suppose that goes to the narrative that you're talking about as well. Like, um, people might hear a lot from the work in my industry, um, a lot of headlines usually come from the conflict and, and tough times facing individuals. But your numbers painted a, a different story there. So do you feel like there's a different narrative in dairy to the one that was just outlined, or do you think both things can be true? Yeah, no, I mean, we're still lending into the sector. 
So we wouldn't if we didn't think there was a future there and, and notwithstanding the short-term volatility. And, my, and that my, includes family farms? And yeah, absolutely. For a whole bunch of reasons, not just economic, but for that other, those, the social fabric they provide as well, which is really important for us. I mean, my, my treasurer is a bit of a cynic and he, he sort of tells me that economics is the art of telling you today why the predictions I made yesterday won't come true tomorrow. But, you know, so you're always... The, um, predictions are just that, they're predictions. Where you get comfort is that even when you stress our book for some of the more doomsday scenarios, you get comfort that there's an orderly way through those scenarios. Um, so, um, but, but we're not predicting that huge market dislocation at this stage. We think it's the longer term uh, prospect for dairy is pretty good. And Greg McNamara, you're in the industry, you're processing. Um, I suppose we've just heard um, why people are scared for the future of the industry with some of the some of the narratives and some of the things that are happening in the industry. But I suppose, give us the case. Why should we have faith in Australian dairy from, from your point of view? It can only go up, can't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... Um, look, I think... Um, I think Australia's in a unique position. I think we've actually... We're transitioning from being that commodity supplier to that more... Uh, niche player style. I think that's um, uh, Norco is probably an example of the Australian industry in a, in a bigger sense. Is that we're we're too big to be really niche, and as we grow, we have this struggle around, you know, how do we actually want to, we maintain that nicheness around our business, um, where we know everyone, we talk to everyone. So, um, and I think the Australian dairy sector is a little bit like that. You know, we were, we were flogging um, butter and um, cheese in 20 kilo lots not so long ago. Now we're actually putting it into package and putting some fancy stuff on around provenance. So, uh, I think I think as we get better at that, I think we'll be um, you know, as as organisations and companies like and you know, And I, I know I was a little bit hard on um, foreign investment a minute ago, but I think one of the great things that foreign investment brings is a level of knowledge. Um, and capacity around doing things differently that we would not have thought about. So uh, I think so, I think that's a great thing of um, that we should look forward to, and and getting those people in a room and understanding what not necessarily what their stra individual strategies are about, but how they want to go about improving um, the lives of their own members or their own um, suppliers. I think that's a, a really good starting point. Uh, some couple of questions from the crowd. We've got one here, and then we'll go up there. Yeah. Hi, uh, Simo Tevin from Martin Jacob Associates. A follow-up question on, on water prices. As you would know, the permanent water prices in the Southern Connected Basin are basically higher than ever right now, and the market is mainly driven by high-value crop growers, nuts, uh, uh, almonds, cotton, and whatnot. What's the sentiment amongst dairy uh, farmers in, in this respect? Are there still dairy farmers out there looking to source more permanent water at these prices, or is the price prohibitive? I don't have kind of a great uh, deal of information on that. We have, we have just done our dairy farmer survey through our ABES farm survey area, and there's, is that covered in, in, in that? But um, incomes are up. Um, but yeah, there's, there's no kind of specific question about expectations around the the role of water pricing and usage, unfortunately, it's probably a bit of a, maybe Dairy Australia has a better take on it than Will, Will, as it yeah, gets more expensive, what does it mean for you? Some, some general trends. Um, uh, when you look at the security that our customers are using to, to borrow from us, land is still the overwhelming security that they're using. They've probably got access to more water than they're putting up for, for security, uh, at least from a first mortgage perspective. Um, I think it's not only the price of water, but it's, a, it's the pricing of the risk management, which is as much the production, so it's the sort of different side of that same coin. And I think it's the risk management factor that water, depending on the quality of your right, is going to be an increasingly important factor. Um, and, and again, it plays into that volatility of cash flow. Um, if you've got a temporary or no water allocation you're buying on the spot market, um, typically you're buying it when it's most expensive, and what does that do for the volatility or the sustainability of your business model? So. Yeah, it's a big issue, I think, going forwards and on how farmers, you know, where that sits in their balance sheet. Is there other ways that they can free up the value of that capital but still get access to the water when they need it? So there's some, you know, there's no silver bullet there. So it's issues rich, I think. Journalists might describe it. <laughs> well, I can tell you in the, in the area where I am from, it's one of the biggest topics for any dairy farmer to talk about. It's water, not only the myriad of product series, but also um, how to use it. But probably a good chance for me to say, we'll be talking water tomorrow at Abares in a panel. Um, uh, come, please come along and listen more there. We had another question up here. Um, John Madden from the Productivity Commission. An interesting point was made about CapEx dropping off 
obviously over the last few years in the south. Um, I don't know if you have any um, information about whether that will rebound and, and any intentions in the south, but then it will be also interesting from here from the north, not in terms of process at CapEx, but in terms of on-farm, what's the story in the north and maybe particularly Queensland as well? Do you see any differences? Um, well, I hope that risk appetite returns because it will make my budgets a lot easier to meet. <laughs> um, uh, so I think it comes back to uh, confidence to take that extra risk. We haven't seen a return in a wholesale sense yet, but I think it is just a temporary factor until people get their balance sheets back into a, the, sort of the levels that they'd like it to be. But we're sort of seeing it, it's a phenomenon you're seeing pretty much across all asset classes, not just agriculture in a post-GFC environment. And you're seeing um, utilisation rates of limits, particularly overdraft rates, just materially different than what they were pre-GFC. Um, you're seeing it in residential markets where people have, they've, you know, if you're like me, your direct debit, your mortgage repayments, and as interest rates have come down, you haven't changed your repayments and you're ahead on your, on your loans. And there's an enormous amount of the Australian population is, you know, three or four months ahead of their loan repayments. And I think it's that general wanting to get your balance sheet in order and de-risking your balance sheet, I think, has occurred in dairy. When will that appetite return? Will it return? It's a good question. Um, but you're seeing pockets of people thinking that now perhaps is the time to start investing again. Um, and you're going to see it. The con continued consolidation is, is one factor that's driving that as well. So a lot of that's driven by when your neighbour's property comes up for sale. Or not. It's not something you can necessarily dictate the timing of. Have we got any more questions out? In oh, the north? Yeah, um, I think... Yeah, so, we, yes, we are seeing some investment. Uh, we uh, personally are actually doing some invest, investment in our own business, but um, I mean, not go. Um, but I think one of the challenges for the dairy sector is everyone hears about dairy and thinks about Australia in the same scenario as what um, has been in the South. So I think that actually plays on people's minds. And I think uh, as an industry, we have an enormous PR issue around um, how people actually perceive us as dairy. And I think that's something that you know, we need to work on as an industry. How do we actually... I know the ACCC is doing a lot of work on, on that at the moment around the volatility and the transparency of information that goes with that for, um, for investment. Because that's, ultimately that's what was um, hurt in that whole crisis. Everyone just took a step back and said, oh, how exposed are we? Um, and that will, that will linger for a period of time. Any more questions before we... I've got a couple more to come into and, and Greg will stay with you because as I was preparing for doing this today I did speak to a couple of um, people in the dairy industry before I came and this quote stuck out to me from someone who's been involved in the dairy industry at a boardroom level um, and here's his quote, I had to write it down because I thought it was fabulous. The dairy crisis was great for Norco and maybe Bega but no one else. Do you think that statement's true? Yep. <laughs> Why? Uh, um... We, um, you don't take advantage of any individual circumstances, but you do need to um, take the opportunity. So we went and had a chat to Coles when um, the dollar leader come in, uh, talked to them about um, changing their strategy from an East Coast model to a regional supply model. Um, we were successful with that. Um, when Murray Goldman got into trouble, we went, um, we went to um, a retailer and said, look, we ne you need to hold your price. Um, we need to look after the Australian farmer. So... Um, but out of that, our brand built uh, dramatic. We've seen 15% um, 15, 15 last year, and I think it's 20% this year in growth in brand. Um, so, and that's been driven by the fact that consumers actually want to buy branded product. And that was driven by one individual on a project um, at 7.30 at night, one night. Um, how powerful, um, if people could understand how powerful that, that sentiment was, I'm sure Wally um, doesn't, understand, um, doesn't understand how powerful that did and the issues that actually arose the next day for... Australian dairy um, and how social media can actually play out and either build your business or destroy it in a flash is incredible. And obviously you can't plan for someone else's misfortune, but was it important for your business to be prepared for something like that to happen, even though you'd probably never in your wildest dreams thought something like that would happen? Yeah, so, so our process wasn't to take advantage necessarily of Murray Goldman. So we actually, um, I personally ring uh, Murray Goldman and actually had conversation with them about what can we do. And that was the same reiteration for we went because we're not competitors, um, but we were actually building a brand, trying to build a branded business. And I, so I think it's uh, important that um, you take the opportunity, but you, you treat it with um, respect, because I think that's what the consumer expects. If someone sees you taking advantage of another, um, 
th then that actually um, plays out poorly for you in the future because they don't trust you. Um, just as we wrap up then, uh, I'd love to get big picture with our guests because that's what ABES is all about a lot of the time, isn't it, sometimes to think about the big picture. I'd love you all to think about a trend or something to watch in dairy as we look at the next year ahead or it can be much more long term than that. But what's something that maybe the people in this room or the people watching can keep in their mind as something to keep an eye on in the dairy industry as we go? It can be a trend at the farm, consumer... Um, banking level, what, whatever you'd like, even the, the even the EU stockpile level, if you'd like, Andrew Cameron, but but whatever. Is there anybody you'd like to go first? Is there something in your mind? There's something you'd like to see, or something Can to I watch. Go? Um, I'm clogging the space. Sorry. I have this vision that um, I'm a great believer in um, our heritage and all the things that come before us. And at some point, the consumer will have a DNA test. They will know what products are, and what diseases they're likely to actually. Um, be inflicted upon in time, and they will choose a diet that actually um, enables them to supply it. And you can actually see a warehouse with a robot going and picking the product for Greg McDamara because he's going to get, I don't know, um, um, what do you call, um, prostate cancer, or in my family it's prostate cancer and um, dementia. So you know, it's something that doesn't get me... Um, but you can actually... And a lot of those things are actually health traits, and we heard earlier today about health traits. And you can see, you can see how the world is changing and how um, the Amazons of the world and the data technology and the algorithms are created that the robot will go and pick all that product. And that's what I'll eat. And I'll live, hopefully, a bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> we hope so, too. Yeah. Uh, Will? Uh, or, or rather than perhaps expand on something we've already discussed... Um, I think, and this is probably uh, an opportunity for agriculture in general, you know, we've got the third largest superannuation industry domestically here in Australia and the world, about $2, million, uh, $2 trillion in assets courtesy of our compulsory super, and that's going to grow to about $9 trillion by 2035. And uh, to put that in context, it's first our GDP of about $1.6 trillion at the moment, and 0.3 of 1% of that is finding its way into agriculture. So we've got this fantastic asset that sits there in the Australian economy and yet it's not being put to this fantastic industry that is ours, which is such a great multiplier effect and such benefits to our economy in general. So I'd like to think as a sector we can put our heads together and find a way to get more of that investment into ag, therefore lowering our cost of capital by definition, but also giving a different type of investment that's a bit longer and better suited perhaps to some of these short-term variances that we've got in cash flow. Um, there's no silver bullet in that. There's some structural issues we need to address, but I think that would be my long-term pie in the sky, I hope. And I'm going to follow up on that just because I'm really interested in your thoughts on this because sometimes super investment in ag is not always seen as rosy by the industry itself. Do you think the industry needs to keep their attitude? I suppose I'm thinking of Kilter Rural sometimes gets a lot of flack for their involvement in water markets and there's a, a superannuations involved in a lot of development of sale yards in, in livestock markets now and that's sometimes not looked on favourably because it's there to make money. Should agriculture change its perception of that? Yeah, I think it's both. We've got to work both with the funds management industry uh, together to get a, a true shared economy because you're right there are great examples of where it hasn't worked in the past uh, and it's been serving different needs um, and it's you know it's probably a comment on the asset allocation sector here so you've got a 30 year old asset allocator with a three million dollar mortgage living in Paddington in Sydney and he's got an agricultural opportunity or he's got CBA shares in a toll road in Brisbane and I know which one's easier to put into his spreadsheet and you know and he's got a he's got his you know Based, he's getting rewards or he's getting a bonus based on his performance in that, in that fund over a, or a quarterly basis against an index. So he's got a 12-week investment horizon. But in agriculture, you've got to take that, again, that longer-term view. So a 10, 12, 15, 20-year investment horizon. And you speak with some of the sovereign funds or the funds out of Asia, for instance, and one of the asset allocators over there was telling me his investment horizon is one or 200 years. You're fundamentally looking at a different investment opportunity. And so... Um, you can get your head around that. He's on that time. good diet, Greg yeah, was yeah, talking yeah. about. <laughs> so you can get so so you know it's it's uh, it's a big issue, and there's no silver bullet. And you're right, there are examples of where it hasn't worked, but I think it's too great an opportunity for us just to dismiss it because there's been a couple of examples where it hasn't worked. Andrew, any uh, trend to watch? Um, I really pie in the sky. I'd like to see Australian cafe culture, like you know, pushed explosively around the world. 
Um, <laughs> I, and I, th I think there's a. I'm, I'm, I'm sort serious? of. I'm, I'm most. I'm three quarters serious. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I can. I can imagine Australian dairy pushing. You know, like A2 milk, like perfect flat white milk in China and the US and Europe, and you know, creating that product and really pushing that idea and you know, connect it into a sort of end consumer market. And I, you know, I can imagine something like that happening. I think there's an opportunity there that if someone wants it, they can. Hmm. They can go for it.